Hello, and welcome to the SMU Video Archive Series. In this series, we interview members of the SMU community who can provide insight into the history of SMU, especially from the perspective of their time at the university. I'm Pam Lang, and today we have with us Ben Petty, Professor Emeritus from the Philosophy Department. Welcome. Thank you. Great. Now, you have been at SMU for a long time. Mm -hmm. when, did you, when did you come? To 1953. Whoa. September 1st, I came here. And uh, started at the bottom of the academic ladder, uh, a one-year contract as an instructor okay. in the religion department mm -hmm. of the College of Arts and Sciences, as it was called then. Um, I guess one reason I got in there was because of my background. I, I do have mm -hmm. a, a master's degree in divinity from, from Emory. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I'm an ordained Methodist minister in Louisiana Conference, and had you know planned to go into teaching, and actually had gone to graduate school in Boston University. So, heard there was an opening uh, at SMU in the undergraduate department, and came over here. Was interviewed by Dr. Reedus and others. Oh yes, Amo Reedus. And uh -huh. uh, if you know, uh, you know that the religion department was in one of the seminar rooms off of the rotunda in Dallas Hall. And Dr. Reedus had a little, small little office with a wall, and then the rest of us, five of us in one room. Really? With no petitions, oh. uh, for sure. Uh, that was the case. At any rate, it was a start, and uh, uh, we were a congenial group. And of course, the teaching load was teaching five courses, five not three, courses. five, yes. Oh. <laughs> and I started teaching five courses, a survey of the Old Testament including one section in the engineering school, which oh was goodness. especially um, <clears throat> difficult. Challenging. They, they were, this is with a religion requirement that they had to take. Oh, and okay. after a while, they had the option of either religion or philosophy, and then eventually uh, you know, going to electives and so on. At any rate, it was a place to get started. And uh, uh, so it was you know, satisfactory. The, I guess one memorable thing about it was is that there was no air conditioning. I remember that. Not that Not I came from air conditioned places in New Orleans, but uh, Dallas Hall with its high ceilings and cross ventilation were fairly bearable, but I taught many a class at the end of Dallas Hall, those end rooms down there where the windows could go up where with the sweat running down my back in oh, the classroom. Yeah. You know. That's hard to imagine, isn't it? It really is hard. And um, so then, when they uh, gutted and redid Heil Hall and air conditioned it, it had been a hot box, uh, That's noisy, been terrible. Oh. noisy, hot, mm -hmm. so on. So the religion department and philosophy moved over there, and we had little small offices in air conditioning. So you had a, your own office at that right. time. You did well, a major, major improvement. Ma for sure. Yeah. Uh, what year was that? Do you remember when they redid Higher Hall? I, I remember I, Dallas Hall. Yeah, was I not think it's I think it's in uh, the sixties. Early sixties. Sure. Yeah. Uh, at any rate, um, I had been here about two years, uh, teaching you know Old Testament, New Testament, got into teaching religious issues mm -hmm. and philosophy of religion, and then got chance to teach a philosophy course in the philosophy department. So. I wound up having a kind of a foot in both you departments. Were in religion and philosophy. Since I was had worked toward a PhD in philosophy at Boston University, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so that was congenial. And of course, teaching in those years meant also going downtown to teach at That's right, Dallas, Dallas College, College downtown on Ackett Street, mm -hmm. uh, in an old hotel that not only was not only not air conditioned, <laughs> but had a reputation that bordered on the color of red. That's terrible. And if those walls down there could have talked in our classes, things would have been spruced up uh, considerably. At any rate, but then in time, the Easterwood building was built, mm -hmm. and it was major improvement. It was much and better, uh, yeah. SMU did render a service uh, to, because many of the people who were there were sent by the, uh, like, Bell Telephone, what have you. That's know, right. And so on. so it, it, uh, mm -hmm. and it was a, is a way, in a sense, to, um, uh, increase your income and things of that sort. Sure, which so, is a necessary because yeah, I find now uh, the salary the was salary, not too high. Because the salary <laughs> scale in 53. It's terrible. 
What was, was it, like five, what, less than that maybe? $3,600 oh. for nine months. Oh my God. With no guarantee of summer school. And of course I taught summer school, both terms all, you all the time. You have to. And of course another angle is, is that of course that I was married with two children. Yeah. And there's no distinction in the rate of pay for the married teachers versus the unmarried ones. Of course no, not. Sorry. And you had the little children. They small, were yeah, small. Yeah, two small children sure. in school. So, uh, tough times, but you know, uh, I, I guess you don't realize how tough, how tough they were in a sense until you get later away from it. Yeah. But I enjoyed continuing to teach in both philosophy uh, and in, and in re religion, in religion. Mm -hmm. and also when it came along, volunteered to teach in the Nature of Man course. Right. And did lecturing here, you know, in mm -hmm. in, in, the, in, for in the Max fresh, and, right. You know, to the That's right. Group. So it was kind of a pioneer in doing that kind of volunteered for that. Um, when did you have a, le a lesser course load? Did it ever go down from? Well, it finally extra? it finally got down. Uh, uh, well, I was also going through the ordeal of trying to finish my dissertation oh, with all of this. <laughs> finally got finished in '61. I'll say to that. That was good. Maybe oh, some kind oh, of a man. track record up at Boston <laughs> University, but it did finally finish. Good, good, good. But anyway, <clears throat> they they finally did cut it down some. Uh, but if you uh, taught, say, three, perhaps, and needed extra, well, then, you know, Dallas College would be tacked on top of that. Sure, so sure. it finally got down. But the classes were uh, uh, good-sized classes. I mean, we how were teaching how 40 many people? Oh, really? 35 and 40 people in, in wow. the classes. Mm -hmm. And I, I have, you know, the, uh, I've got the great books to prove it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, at any rate, um, <clears throat> so then, uh, uh, you know, a little later, it, it turns out that the philosophy department had had several losses uh, with death and other moves, mm -hmm. and Dean Harris of the School of Arts and Sciences asked me to be uh, chairman of it. Okay. And so I became chairman of the philosophy department. And in a sense, you know, when you're doing that and you've got a foot in another department and you're now got supposedly both feet in the other department, you really can't kind of wear two hats at the same time, uh, two sets of committee meetings and things of that sort. So no, it's not possible. In, in a sense, while I still taught philosophy and religion was kind of like my specialty, <clears throat> offering it through the religion department as, as it came along and eventually changed to religious studies, you know. Exactly, that, that exactly, changed. right. Uh, <clears throat> I was basically concentrating on teaching uh, in the philosophy department. And uh, so, so, and and that's what I, I've done on, on until down, you know, down to yeah, the time. Yeah. So you re, you really yeah, specialized yeah. into. In and the then I guess another thing that I got involved with was uh, when the MLA program, Master yeah. of Arts program, I started mm -hmm. teaching in that and offered a course in philosophy of religion and another on the problem of evil. Right. And those have been my two courses. Mm -hmm. So I've been teaching in that ever since. Right. Teaching. And the course in philosophy of religion right now. And yeah, taught. I mean, you're teaching right now. You retired in 91, oh, yes. but you uh, just said you were teaching three I, or four courses. I've got courses. three full courses and an informal course as well. Mm. So I, I really feel that, uh, you know, I had a chance to contribute to the Master of Liberal Arts. Actually went down to t teach it in Tyler. Uh, Did you? Yeah, that, at uh -huh, night, uh -huh. offered down there. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't go up to Baldwin, Kansas or to Alaska like some did, but, but never, you did go. nevertheless um, mm -hmm. have taught regularly along and felt it was a valuable thing. And I must say, and I'll throw this in uh, with a kind of sense of pride, my wife took my philosophy of religion course and got a Master of Liberal Arts degree. Great, great. And my son and daughter took my courses at SMU. Uh -huh. I taught my daughter in four my son in three, that's and of course that's breaking the old tradition that You're not you never sign up for your father's course because he's going to be too hard on you, but you or maybe they, th they think they're going to be too easy. Yeah. But I tried to deal with them as objectively as I could. How'd they do? <clears throat> How did they do? I thought, <laughs> <laughs> and they've had a lot of jokes when well, I'm giving birth to the quiz upstairs and they're <laughs> trying to read my mind. Yeah. Mental telepathy still doesn't work uh, no. too well. But anyway, it, it, I, I really felt uh, pleased that they they sought me out and took my courses. Sure, sure. Well, and 
I don't think every teacher has had that experience, but it was a good thing for, for me. That's good. You know, I re I take, took at least three of your courses when I yeah. was an undergraduate at SMU. Yeah. I really liked them, and I thought you were a born teacher. So when it, the names came up of people to interview, I thought, I want to do Ben Petty, even well. though because I, I re <laughs> have such fond memories, and I learned so much, and I think, those courses are valuable, uh, especially right now. I mean, the problem of evil and the philosophy of religion. Yeah, no, and I think no I took a, a class in uh, world religions yeah, as well. Right. You must have, yeah. so, I, I'm sure you gave so, that. But uh, I have those books still at home. Yeah. And it, I, well, I learned so much about the world and about other people's points of view that I think are yeah. especially valuable. Well, that's what, that's what this uh, a liberal arts university mm -hmm. ought to be trying to sure, do and, sure. and is doing, I think. Mm -hmm. And of course, as I've seen, the you know the campus has changed. We had yeah, a, we a, a, a sort of ramshackle, <laughs> a wooden building. It was a student center. Oh yeah, uh, I, over I, that I direction. And then that. of course, Humphrey Lee got built. A tremendous improvement. Uh, there were some Quonset huts left over from right World after War World War II. War, mm -hmm. uh, two. And then of course, as I say, with the remodeling of Dallas Hall, <clears throat> an excellent piece of work of preserving right. the integrity of the past. Uh, keeping the worn stones that the yeah, students have worn right, down and the, it, yeah. the, the uh, woodwork, you know, things of that sort, while modernizing it, air conditioning, lighting, and so on. Thank goodness, so, the air conditioning. Uh, air conditioning. <laughs> oh. So, uh, you know, major changes from that standpoint. And, of course, as far as strength is concerned, I believe when I came, maybe there was maybe 13 million dollars in endowment and a yeah, lot of it was look at how for much. the School mm -hmm. of Theology. Well, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I think I heard the other day it was 400, you know. So major changes uh, with building buildings with this modified uh, Georgian exactly. architecture right. producing really a, a campus, if you compare it to many other schools that are much a hodgepodge and so yeah, we've, we've got really got a well thought out, attractive mm -hmm, campus mm -hmm. and a good good location. Right. And of course, it's it's a safe area. That's right. another problem University that's come Park, on. Right. And with more lighting and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. So we have certainly seen major improvements uh, in many ways. Uh, library resources uh, have certainly been fine. The Bridwell Library it's, yeah, it's one it, of the it, best. is a gem mm -hmm. in itself. Certainly. Uh, one of the best mm -hmm. libraries in the, in the country. And so uh, the students that come here have certainly have access access to materials. Right. Now, have you noticed a change in the students? I know we talked about the religion requirement. Did they have a chapel requirement, too, when you first no, came no here? Chapel Never chapel requirement. That, no. that was gone. <clears throat> mm -hmm. The religion requirement, <clears throat> oh, you had people in there that were taking it because they needed the hours and it was a requirement. And it's a kind of a challenge to, to try to get these people who were the start of just <laughs> plain disinterested and even a little disgruntled <laughs> to have to take this exactly. to try to get them interested in the material. And I think our department was one where we didn't brainwash, we were respectful of differences of opinion, mm -hmm. right, you were. and we really uh, got them interested in historical materials and mm -hmm. so on, mm -hmm. and we generated majors and people that went on to take other work and so on. See, mm -hmm. And I think that was a tribute. Dr. Reedus was a very fine, tolerant uh, chairman and person. And he communicated that to all, all the teachers that were there. So we registered, and I think a lot of that sort of semi-hostility of having to take this course uh, faded uh, with, with most of them, well, for sure. It's very interesting, yeah. you know. And then, of course, after, when it wasn't one, you had people who were taking it because it was an elective. Right, it was, that's what I did. I mean, taking I both had to religion take it, and philosophy, you mm -hmm, know, that, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Well, I've always been very interested. I mean, I'm English, was an English major, but I liked philosophy. Yeah. And religion took quite a few yeah. uh, courses in both in both schools, and I think it's it's really uh, you know important to for that. Uh, do you think that now you were a Methodist minister? Yeah. Why did you decide to you wanted to teach instead of be a, a, a well, pastor? Well, I guess <coughs> <laughs> uh, that's a question. Yeah, back <laughs> in high school. We used to fill out these little blanks, and they had a little blank that, what, what do you plan to be? Uh -huh. And somehow or other, I kind of wrote down professor of history, okay. the idea of teaching. My father was an architect mm -hmm. in my grandfather's construction firm. I was the only one of three children that went to college. Didn't have any immediate ones on my father's side. My wife's uh, <clears throat> grandfather was a professor of Anglo-Saxon oh, okay. at Tulane, Tulane University Tulane, in New Orleans mm -hmm. and so on. But I think, I think that what really turned me on is that I went to seminary. Uh, I was a senior at Tulane when uh, Pearl Harbor. 
already licensed to preach mm. as a Methodist preacher in the mm -hmm. local church. And my draft board allowed me to continue in school and not be drafted. And when I finished in 42 of June, went to Emory, University mm -hmm. Campbell School of Theology, uh, to get a, what's, it was a BD, is now a Master of Divinity degree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, while I was there, uh, there was a new teacher that had come from Boston University named Max Stokes, mm -hmm. who had uh, recently gotten his PhD in philosophy at Boston University. And he taught a course in philosophy of religion, and I read Dr. Ed S. Brightman, at his writing mm -hmm. on that, and that's what really turned that's me what off. That's what turned you off. And on. this teacher, of course, encouraged me. He felt that I could do it. I was an English major. Yeah, right, like me. <laughs> Tulane. Uh, and I'd had two courses in philosophy, just introductory ones. Mm -hmm. You know, so with, with fear and trembling, but with his encouragement, went up there. And it's a five-year program, you know, with... Uh, Five uh, qualifying exams and two language oh, exams. Oh, yeah, lots it's, of it's stuff. It's not one of those mail order things. No, where, no, I know. It's one, uh, yeah, very. So, uh, so I went up there, um, married, and had started the Wesley Foundation in New Orleans at Tulane University mm -hmm. and went up in January and of uh, <clears throat> 45. The war ended while we were up there. And I had two Methodist churches that had no parsonage okay. and were at the bottom of the New England Annual Conference barrel in the <laughs> middle of the year. Oh, uh, and I, we got these and uh, served these churches while we were there. Uh, and this is housing shortage, and we had set some kind of a record up there. And in the last year we were there, we moved five times oh, for heaven's and sake. spent the winter of the fifth, the fifth move into the basement of the church, oh. uh, with our with son taking b uh, baths in the sink, and oh. we take baths out with the parishioners. Oh, no. uh, so anyway, we we survived. Of course, you decided that was not, not the life for you. Came back to New Orleans, and I got a position while working on my dissertation as an assistant pastor of a large Methodist church in New Orleans, and was there for five years and then heard about the opening okay. here and came mm -hmm. here. So, you so thought in you, a yeah. sense, um, I really, uh, the, all the work for the PhD was to teach, and I felt I could do it. Sure. And uh, never had an education course, but, you oh, know. Oh, no, well, uh, no, got a, no got a, college professors got a chance really to, ever do. To yeah. do it. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I think with, if, if you're really interested in the material, and it's stimulating to you, then that's the first step to being able to maybe get others interested and so on. Mm -hmm. And then there's a the whole question about a university encourages you to study. That's right. You have the opportunity, the access to books. You don't have to fight for time. Now, I'm not running the ministry down. I'm very sympathetic for the people that are in it. You can't say no. The funerals are at 10 in the morning. That's right. You've got to you, be you there. Uh, people are in the it, hospital. And so, you know, it's a kind of a good thing that Professors here who are ordained really cannot serve a church uh, oh, while they're not. teaching. It's really, they're two full-time jobs. I don't care, you know, how big or small the church is mm -hmm. and so on. No, it's so, true. So, at any rate, uh, I have nine and a half years of credit uh, in the Methodist Church as serving churches and then have taught here, uh, you know, get my pension is basically from SMU. Yes. And since we've been here, we've been active in University Park Methodist Church. I teach a Sun Tzu class. Been doing it since 1955. Wow. All the way through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So keeping my hands, singing the choir, things like that. Yeah. So um, it's it's a case, and it, it's a little a little point with me that if you're technically trained in religion, uh, you ought to be using that. And one way to use it is in the classroom, but another way to use it is in the local church. Well, sure, and actually And, of course, you know, that's the day of rest, yeah. <laughs> which some people worn out with dealing with religion all week long feel they've got to observe, you know. Exactly. But so that's my, my feeling. So I've been very much involved. So you've also, been participating in Methodism, actually, since you were, you right. were born. You and your wife were both uh, born yeah, into we were, the church. Yeah, we were, uh -huh. as I mentioned earlier, I met her when we were six years old yeah. in the primary department of Falk Memorial Methodist Church in New Orleans, where we grew up where we were married. I had a junior church in my last year as a senior Tulane in that church of the children. 
Uh, my wife played uh, to be played the piano for it, and I was the preacher. Uh -huh. And we went over and had communion with. Uh, uh, and so you know we had a little sort of church experience before we ever went to seminary, and I had churches all the way through seminary, mm -hmm. which some theologues didn't do, but it. I was preparing to go into to, to the ministry, and I felt like actually having a hand in it, mm -hmm. uh, and not just reading about it. So we, we served churches on the weekend and went to school. And, see, and that, that, that gave me background that enabled me to handle things in New Orleans and up in Boston as well. So, mm -hmm. so you, you, and you're, I think, a born teacher. And I think that preachers are too. But, yeah. you know, but they have all that other stuff they have right. to do. Well, and those parish and all right. that. That's yeah. right. Then, then another angle about it is, is that, uh, in a sense, there's, there's a limit to what a minister can do in a sermon without losing them. Oh, exactly, it has to be at you, a certain level. To, yeah. uh, it's really a tough mm -hmm. job to mm -hmm. reach all the levels of understanding that are there. Because if you get too simplistic, then you alienate the, the yeah. more informed ones. If you get too scholarly and so on, well then you lose everybody, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's, a, it's a real tough thing. But here, every semester is a new ball game. That's right. And even if it's the same course, maybe it, they even change, it change textbooks on you. That's another challenge. True. But just to deal with the same textbook, the same materials, with a whole new set of students is a really um, a, a, a fresh new challenge. And Yeah, and of course the, the questions that you're talking about, like the problem of evil, I mean, they're just... Oh, the perennial you know, questions or eth and, and other, know, ethics for questions. For that matter, the other people... philosophical questions oh, sure. in epistemology and metaphysics exactly. are still there. Mm -hmm. and, and, of course, reading, say, some primary sources of some really famous thinkers who've dealt with these topics and actually see what they said in a primary source has an authenticity about it. Exactly. I remember hand. taking a course and we read Bonhoeffer and Tillich right. and all, and that right. was so imp amazing to me. And I still remember some of the things they said because these are, quite, they, these are the great, great theologians sure. of our time, of or time. of the past so, times thinking, uh, and then, and then course, here we were reading those texts, that's what then, we read. You know, um, if a course is offered in, uh, along that line, mm -hmm. uh, ten years later, its content will change, likely be changed course, to some degree. Of see? Mm -hmm. so, and then you have to keep up uh, with that. See, So it's just uh, an environment that is stimulating in the classroom, you know, with the feedback from the students, but also stimulating uh, by virtue of causing you to uh, uh, be abreast mm -hmm. and to sharpen your skills and things of that sort. Then another thing that um, I feel pretty proud about, uh, and that is uh, early, um, <clears throat> I got asked to be secretary treasurer of the AAUP, mm -hmm. the American Un Association. Association University of Professors, and I have a, you know a good long history of. <laughs> Being always a bridesmaid, and I actually <laughs> did get elected president, but, <laughs> but I, you were, I really had a continuity. Not that we had any real difficulties, except to say there was the AEUP that went to bat and helped Willis Tate get the Alexander Micklejohn Award. Right. I went to Washington, oh, D.C. Uh -huh. uh, with Carter Murphy when he got mm -hmm. it. Uh, so we, uh, we represented academic freedom here and went to bat for, for teachers that felt they had grievances and so on, mm -hmm. and certainly had basically the cooperation of the university. We never had any censure of uni university for doing uh, some uh, for bad all those years. Or anything, so right? I feel good about my role. How long you were in that? Quite a while, well, weren't I, you? Uh, Did you remember? Yeah. Got a little list. I'm there. supposed to be semi senile. No, well, you know, I, you know, I, you know. I would not say that. I mean, well, you anyway, would never know your date uh, of birth that was well, on Well, I was no with AUP and Secretary of Treasury and present for uh, 25 years. Whoa, so they never changed you. Yeah, they did, <laughs> and, and, and the same salary, of course. Of course, of so, course, zero. And I was, <laughs> then the other, I guess, the other little, nice little feather in my cap, at least, is that um, I got elected secretary treasurer. There you go <laughs> Professional again. bridesmaid yeah. um, of uh, Phi Beta Kappa. Mm -hmm. so, and, and you were that uh, for a long time, yeah, too. Yeah, right, and that, that went on for 16 years. Oh, my goodness. And I was president of the chapter. I'll throw in a little... Mm -hmm. uh, tidbit here. They elected me president of the chapter since I'd been secretary of treasury these years. Of but the reason they did it was is that my daughter Anne was coming up to be elected. Oh, okay. And she got elected as a junior and I got a chance to give her Phi Beta her Kappa Key her Tour. Oh. And it turns out to be 
the Phi Beta Kappa key that uh, my wife's grandfather earned from Tulane, oh, which my, we how great. engraved with her name on it and oh, so on, which was exciting. a nice little, that nice little is. touch. Mm -hmm. So my role with, AE, with the Phi Beta Kappa, and then I've been active in the North Texas Association, been president mm -hmm. of and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. So my work with Phi Beta Kappa here, I think, is, is something I'm really proud of, as well as with AAUP, with the AUP. and certainly with the MLA. And then I think, I guess I really am uh, pleased with the fact that continuing education studies yeah, uh, soon got into asking me, could I come up with some sort of informal courses? Are these informal ones at least, they're, they're informal in the sense that there are no, no papers to grade. That's nice. No <laughs> grades to give out. That's right. Um, also, but. they're inexpensive in some. So I taught a whole bunch. I've taught f uh, 50 of them. Oh, my goodness. And have had good enrollment. Got one going right now, Modern Masters of Philosophy. You have it going? Uh, yeah, dealt, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. We uh, dealt with uh, <clears throat> uh, Hegel and yeah. Schopenhauer and mm -hmm. John Stuart Mill and Karl Marx mm -hmm. and just uh, finished uh, Søren Kierkegaard and mm -hmm. next week is Friedrich Nietzsche. Okay. Now it's a one-shot deal, hour and a half, you know, with a reading of read. their material mm -hmm. and a reading list at the end. And you have people in there who want to be there out of interest. And it, Mary Miller, who was one of, and no, Fred Bryson there. were You're the right. ones that were really the catalysts that started mm -hmm. that. And it's reached a lot of people and it's generated interest in even in some people going back to school to get a degree right. and certainly maybe getting into the Master of Liberal Arts program as well, all mm -hmm. graduate work, see. Right. Yeah. So it, and it's, it's a, and it's being offered elsewhere, you know. So, so my, my role in teaching informal courses, I think I'm, I'm proud of. And uh, again, once more, if you've got an hour and 20 minutes to cover one of these big topics, <laughs> kind of hard, uh, you it? better have it on your fingertips. That's uh, right. You know. But uh, it, it, it sort of can be done. You know, you, you can't do the, complete the justice. Right. But I, I keep saying I'm trying to whet an interest. Mm -hmm. W-H-E-T. E -T, not right. Yes, not exactly. Dampen, not, no, not dampen. Not dampen. Wet, right. Wet. Tone sharpen. Sharpen. Right. Sharpen. And we so certainly do. I those, think are, those are things mm -hmm. that, that, those are opportunities that SMU has offered me while I taught here, you know, from 53 you know, down to 91, and the 10 years since then. So. Yeah, you've just kept up at just uh, an amazing pace. So, um, business ethics has gotten to be a big item in the philosophy department. I'm teaching a class of 45 of it right now. Right now. So teaching you're 19th century uh, philosophy, which is kind of like one of my specialties. Yeah. Uh, teaching philosophy of religion in the Master Level Arts Program mm -hmm. and in this informal course. Uh, and I've taught, you know, uh, introduction to philosophy and ethics and things of that sort. But I guess philosophy of religion, 19th century. Mm -hmm. Those and are your I, favorites. And I've, I've mm -hmm. uh, had done a lot of in, in the business. Uh, the a applied ethics are an right. interesting, valuable mm -hmm. uh, area. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I, I, I just feel like um, maybe early back there in high school, I had the feeling I was going to be a teacher. Yeah, you must have been, did you? And uh, lo and behold... Uh, I wind up being one, and yet at the same time, uh, keeping my hand in the ministry. Yeah. See, mm -hmm. and and a, and an ordained person teaching in a university could could do that if they saw fit, you know. Sure. So, but obviously, I think it's a good policy to somebody, especially in a big school with a lot of responsibility, to preclude them from taking on the responsibility of a church, Having no matter a whole how small church. it is. Right. I think you're right. I right. really do. Um, did you see, uh, were you ever active in like the faculty senate or any organizations like yes. that? Yes. I was on in the, the faculty that. senate mm -hmm. uh, for a, a good time. Uh, I've been on, uh, you know, a whole number of committees in, in the college sure. as well as, uh, you know, committee work connected with, with both departments uh, mm -hmm. have come along. So I feel like I've done my, my share of, of committee work. Uh, I guess AEUP uh, was so, sort of like my main sort of sure. uh, piece of work uh, that I was doing, you know, trying to serve the university as a whole. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, uh, I, I think, think really did some good work in 
getting grievances properly addressed. Not that there ever really been a bad atmosphere at SMU. They have really in endorsed AAUP principles mm -hmm. by and large, uh, you know, through through the years. And uh, the Alexander Mick Award, award to, uh, to Willis, Willis Tate, Tate. Uh, right. was uh, really evidence of it for sure. Mm -hmm. Who was president when you when you arrived? Was that Willis? He wasn't here yet. Was uh, that Humphrey Tate? Lee. Humphrey Lee. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. did you notice a difference in the different presidents? I mean, Willis Tate was here for so long. And well. Uh, SMU's building program was just getting going, and Willing State was really a big catalyst for that. And I must say about him that he, he certainly did speak to a variety of publics. He actually was able to really kind of sell SMU to downtown Dallas mm -hmm. business mm -hmm. people and um, spoke to all sorts of groups um, representing the school, I think, in a very positive way. Uh, I just one little episode was that mm -hmm. my, my son uh, won third place in a soapbox derby uh. <laughs> race over a big hill, Chalk Hill, over in, in oh, Oak, yeah, Cliff. Oak Cliff. <laughs> so we go down to the um, <coughs> awards banquet downtown, a hotel across from the crane station downtown, up in the banquet room on the top floor, uh, to, for him to get his third place little uh, a prize for being third place. And as a speaker for the occasion, it's Willis Tate. Oh, really? <laughs> Willis Tate shows up, you know. Knew him, you know, and all that stuff. So that, that indicates something of the variety of publics that he spoke to and represented real well. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it, in, in many ways he um, is, it deserves a lot of credit for SMU's physical expansion mm -hmm. and uh, in, increase in endowment to become because we had the sustentation fund, That's right, which was, that. Yeah, if we don't get <laughs> sustenance, the faculty's going to starve, the university's going to, they're going to turn the lights off, things like that. Well, maybe that bad, you know, but, yeah, but I mean, that's what it was. The endowment was so low, see. Well, in a sense, the endowment increased and... It has certainly and now, and there still it, needs it, to be more uh, of not, it. Not quite so needed, you know, mm -hmm. but although it was a kind of good thing because SMU was the school here. It's no longer the school here, but it was, it was at that time. At that yeah. time, you see, mm -hmm. and so it had a variety of Dallas people con contributing in, in a small kind of a way. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that um, uh, the uh, presidents ha haven't always um, had an opportunity to get in on the ground floor of a kind of mushrooming development, which Willis Tate had. See, mm -hmm. uh, and he was a person to subsequent do it. presidents, in a sense, were kind of you know, reinforcing and presiding over what had been, what, what in a sense, what had been accomplished. Mm -hmm. uh, but surely, uh, President Turner has presided over a real exactly. renaissance. The latest, so, you know, it's a huge, buildings, the buildings and the museum, the more, the, right. uh, or the gem and its, mm -hmm. uh, set the, and of course the Bridwell it's, Library expansion and right, things and of the, that sort and, and the new the science building field. going up, things <laughs> of that sort. So, so uh, uh, we've, we've got, uh, uh, again, uh, not only a, a, a well for the, like that, that marvelous garage over there by the law, law school. I mean, oh, that's right. really, a, really a excellent garage. That's right. I mean, whether any cars go in or not, you know, it's a pretty building. It's you good know. to have that, all and those garages we, so on the airline, too. Parking, so we're, oh, yeah, yeah so, parking has so, uh, uh, always a been good a problem. Good thinking out, you know, and mm -hmm. using space, not jamming things together. Uh, Emory University, when I've gone back here, uh, ravines with dogwood and buildings oh, yeah, that beautiful. had uh, mm -hmm. um, tile roofs on. They've got other buildings, modern stuff. Jammed really in all there, mixed in together, so they ruined together. it. Yeah, and, and and lost any kind of aesthetic uh, uh, uniformity or, or quality. You know, mm -hmm. so, so that's not true here. Um, you just can't help. I mean, the, the view from the third floor of Dallas Hall, or for that matter, just on the sheer steps. You know, mm -hmm. it is the hilltop. Right, and it, you can and see. Looking on Bishop Boulevard is it, it, really uh, impressive. And I, I, another, I'll just throw in another thing I'm proud of. I'm not getting into the things I'm not proud of, particularly. That's good. But <laughs> we won't we talk about that. We haven't got enough time. I'm no, proud. we don't. Well, well, we'll start with the good. We I've can have been another a marshal for uh -huh. SMU yeah. in a variety of ways. Uh, at baccalaureate, uh, carried the uh, I put the hood on. President Bush, the former President oh, Bush, yes, at, when, when he, he got his degree, mm -hmm. and uh, the next morning, 
opened up the paper, Sunday morning paper, and there I am on the front page of the Dallas Morning News putting the hood Putting the great, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> First time and only time I've ever been on the front page of the Morning News. Well, so, that's good. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. uh, but being a marshal at uh, the opening ceremonies, at uh, the degree awarding ones and things mm -hmm. of that sort, uh, is something I've enjoyed doing and have continued to do since, since retirement. Yeah. And I must say, and I give a lot of credit to Lauren Howard, uh, SMU's got a very dignified, well thought out series of ceremonies for not only mm -hmm. baccalaureate, but for commencement and for the opening ceremonies mm -hmm. of the year. Mm -hmm. And with uh, the SMU Wind Symphony playing oh, and, it's really and the lights, it, they've, uh, I've really got, uh, uh, you know, we went through it in the 60s, uh, you know, uh, uh, making fun of the ceremonial side. Oh, absolutely, yes. We never really had much of that here at all in, no, in the really 60s. Didn't. Mm -hmm. But we've really got it down. And people, I think, appreciate realizing that this has been planned. The program mm -hmm. indicates mm -hmm. that. They learn about what the ceremonial robes mean, what the colors mean, things of that right. sort, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, and uh, I, I do feel like that uh, that's that's one place where SMU has made uh, registered and and Lauren Howard uh, uh, have a retired uh, you know chief marshal mm -hmm. now Bob, Bob, Brad Carter uh, continuing that tradition of, of really showcasing SMU uh, in color in a mm -hmm. very uh, dignified uh, manner. And a major improvement, if you recall, is that no longer do you have to wait for everybody's name to be called out to go up to get that diploma. Right, right. Because okay. the minute your son gets his diploma, your interest in what follows that's drops true. off. Yes, to and say the so least. you drop out. Yeah. Uh, so that's the only thing. So here we have diploma ceremonies in different the locations that are right. personalized. Mm -hmm. We find out about the people at our majors and talk about them in a small setting. We do that in philosophy department. We do it with they religious do it studies yeah. together. Mm -hmm. And that is a, and the, and the parents and the relatives like that. And it speeds up the morning ceremony so we are not there into that. And of course, we're in air condition. I've been to some ones where lined up outside mm -hmm. and people were fainting out sure. there in the heat, you know, to get in. So things, mm -hmm. Things are improved they air conditioning wise. Well. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Now you uh, you've taught ethics so much, and I wonder what your feelings were when SMU had all the problems with the with the football uh, scandals and everything. That was a hard time for the university. Well, it certainly was a hard time, uh, but uh, I think it was it was addressed and not covered up. I mm -hmm. I give a lot of credit to the people that. Uh, you know, looked into it, and in a sense, there was a, a really kind of a house cleaning. Yeah. And I think the house has been kept clean. I think so. And too. that has registered, I think. In some ways, I think SMU got punished more harshly. Mm -hmm. Other schools at the same time were guilty in the same ways, but for various reasons, didn't get their the, death the spanking that right. SMU did, you know, that, that kind of thing. But um, Lonnie Cleaver uh, played a pretty significant role as That's a faculty right. person mm -hmm. over the committee looking into it, and I think uh, earned a lot of respect for the university's administration in, in really trying to get to the bottom of things. Uh, the students um, were really uh, appalled, you know, at, at the time, and of course. You know, every four or five years, you got a whole new batch. Yeah, right. And so this is piece of history that you kind of have to re-mention, you know. Mm -hmm. But since then, we've had certainly a an effort to recruit uh, students and and athletic leaders who are going to run a a, a clean show and basically have done so. And uh, but it was a it was a bad time. Uh, it was sure. a bad time, <laughs> and I and I I think that. Now we have very high graduation rates for our, our, we we don't admit right. athletes that can't graduate. It's really not fair to them, and I think SMU is uh, we're trying to hold on to that. That, that you know we, we may not be winning all the games, but we're 
we're certainly uh, yeah. we have our the standards that are the highest and, in the, um, almost higher than the NAACP standards. Yeah, we don't have uh, two curricula. I mean, you know, a, a, a lower less demanding curricula no, for we the don't. ethnic we don't. types. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've got uh, got them and. and uh, uh, you know, they make every effort to keep us informed about when they're going to be aware. Right. Uh, they have all these uh, special efforts to help them uh, because I tell you, you can't study where you're on the swim team. No, it's really uh, you, hard. Uh, when you're in the pool, you just can't study. You can't That's, be reading your I book. No. I don't care. <laughs> you just can't. So those people that have to put in a time to succeed, uh, They've got the same amount of time, day and night, as the students that are not participating in that. Exactly. Athletes. And they've got the same requirements, you see. Mm -hmm. So they need help, and they are getting it. They uh, are. F mm -hmm. thank, thank goodness. And, and, uh, and I think the teachers are, uh, you know, uh, not favoring them, treating them, like, uh, treating them like the rest, but willing to help them make up when they have to have right. to miss, I hope so. I mean, we're working, I'm on the faculty senate right now, and they're, that's one of the issues they're talking about, you know. The, fa the athletes need to, they need to have some professors evidently don't let them make up anything and it's not fair. I mean, well, a, it's not. It's an it, issue, I think it's know? not fair just in general because if you say uh, you miss the quiz zero without considering the reasons, That's you right. are going to do an injustice because they're all legitimate reasons. They they're are. They're not just based on athletics and so No, on. there are some people really they're ill yeah, or no, they you, have a you, problem. Once you open the door, that you can maybe have to take a makeup and hope that it won't be as hard as the original and that kind of thing that that provides a way out for the weaker student that's, that hasn't done their work and so on but nevertheless i think better to to have that option mm -hmm. than have this closed door policy that really does an injustice because um, there are all kinds of reasons um, and i've You've heard I think them all. I've accepted the whole list. <laughs> I have too. I'm sure. I, uh, Maybe some extras. I, uh, I guess the the one that kind of tops it with me. And of course, you know, I'm from New Orleans. Yeah. And we always celebrate Mardi Gras of on Tuesday. Yes. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I've always had students that uh, who, who didn't show up for class on Tuesday and, and weren't even there on Monday, and you know, had a big long weekend down there and so. Of course. But of course, um, I guess the the classic case was the one who offers me the excuse. Uh, about why he wasn't in class on Tuesday on Mardi Gras Day. Uh, and it turns out it wasn't a very valid excuse because I saw him on TV in New Orleans oh, so by funny. sheer accident. Uh, so anyway, uh, and I keep telling my students, I grew up with Mardi Gras. I went to my first Mardi Gras uh, uh, parade dressed as a baby because I was a baby. You were a baby. And I went through... All, Mardi Gras all of my life until I moved over in 53 and always trapped on Tuesday. Uh, you know, hour and a half class, you just can't, you've got to be there, you know, and That's you right. are there. But uh, nevertheless. You could never go back because you had your classes. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that uh, uh, treating athletes as like everybody else, uh, but recognizing that they need some help given the, in, the inroads on their time and energy so the, yeah, that their sport does. Now, sure. they, football in the fall, you know, basketball in the spring, swimming all along. Kind of, and other uh, sports, soccer, yeah, all those. You have to take I've that into went. consideration. I do. I certainly think and you do. And, the, the, you know, they've really put money in, you know, Ruth Hawshaw. Yeah, the uh, LEC, the Learning Enhancement Center, really and all those really a good tutors. piece of work. It, it's they really are following through, you know, and I think it's paying off in the graduation rates. Yeah, I know it is. I mean, our graduation rate, I think Tennessee's is the worst, and ours is one of the best, that yeah, they, right. our graduation yeah. rate. It's, I think that's important because otherwise you're exploiting those athletes. If they don't graduate, they're, gonna, they're not going to, they probably won't get on the... And, of course, if, if they're, you know, the other angle is if they're not good athletes, right. they can't go on to the big money. And if they don't graduate, then they haven't got a college education, and they can't qualify right. in the pros. So they've, they've been victimized, you see, I think in a lot so. of ways. And I don't think we do that and, out here. You know, at one time, when we had the, when there was the corruption and stuff, that's one thing. But now I think it really is cleaned up, and we're striving to, to yeah. keep it that way, not yeah. back back down and say, oh, well, we're going to have a major or something. It needs to be constantly, major constantly monitored. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you have to really, because there's always the pressure to, we want to win. Yeah. 
we want to win, and, and that's well, a problem. I, I, I having um, my uh, football's been mine, and I guess I was conditioned for SMU because I went to <laughs> Tulane, where we always got beat by LSU. Yes, that was the big course. rival up in Baton yes. Rouge. So we come over here at the end of the Doak Walker era, and we go into sort of got to decline, you know. Yes. So. <laughs> and so I've gone to many, many games. But, you know, I, I know Jerry Levias and so on. Yeah, and this last you. game, we got a great runner in Sean Derrick Charles, That's you know, right. mm -hmm. great new freshman back, you know. That's to, true. Here we go. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, when you say you've been at the bottom, any kind of moving up is, is a, much appreciated. Yeah. And since you, if you've taught these some of these students and kind of know them. Yeah, it's, it's that exciting. really makes it come out. Like it Luke does. Croy had him as a freshman. Did you, know, you so, really? Uh -huh. so I, 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 that really makes the game come alive. You know, I taught Gerald Sasser. Oh, I mean, I, I had know, Gerald Sasser you know, too so, in my class. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, I, it's exciting. I don't isn't have it? to win. I mean, no. I, I, and of course, we got this marvelous new stadium. That's it's right. Really excellent. It stadium. is beautiful. Uh, really. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 you know, and, and we've got. Women's sports, well, we've got excellent, exactly. you know, best soccer, Wonderful. Uh, basketball, mm -hmm. you know. Sure, swimming, so we, we've got you know, a, a round, rounded thing, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think some good steady hands on the helm here. Well, I so I don't I think we're going to have any other scandals. and I, But I think we need to bear in mind that we, we certainly had one. We did have one, and it was very damaging, I yeah. think, in many, many ways. Yeah. What about the students? Do you see the change in the students? I know they're trying to... Was well, it they were they better back in the fifties or or, na or now? You're still teaching, fifty yeah, years well, later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you see, well, you've seen the well, beginning. Well, I, I I think there, um, I don't have any ones that are in a sense you wonder how they ever got in the yeah. first place. No, that's true. Um, they well, they, they one, don't even one. get in. No. Um, I think you have more of a concern to be prepared for some kind of career afterwards. And not not just the pre-med ones. Mm -hmm. And I just want to throw in business, yeah. and mentioning that I'm proud of the fact that I've been on the pre-med committee oh, for great. for decades, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. still am. And it's a very good rate of, of acceptance yeah. to medical school. And uh, we, you know, write up mm -hmm. the interview. We have an interview with the pre-med students, uh, and then uh, write up the input from all the professors, and yeah, then uh, the, the three mm -hmm. of us an interview. And one of us writes it up, you Great. see. Mm -hmm. And we, we put time in on it, and the schools know that. So SMU has a good reputation. And, and so, so I've been on Harold Jeske got me on that. Oh, I remember Harold. And my little yeah. number here. <laughs> you got your, yeah, you checked yeah, my out little, your. My little number here. I've been on pre-med committee for 33 years. Oh, boy. But, you know, we have such a good acceptance rate. No wonder. You've yeah. been on it. And, that, and Harold Jeske, of course. Oh, uh, yeah. He was a, he a was big, big yeah. catalyst on it. You he know, was. Ed Beal and others. Mm -hmm. And it's, Ed, it's done mm -hmm. good work. And it's, you know, pre-dent as well as pre-medical. Sure. But I do, you've got, though the pre-med, pre-dental types are really quite concerned because they, you've got to pass the MCAT, you know, mm, test. And, and all those hard. If you don't have a three- Five average, you, you're really sort of not like not accepted. Running. Yeah. So they're they're the students that are sort of really serious to get the grades, but I think uh, by and large most of them they want to get a, get a diploma from the school that they feel like they earned. I think that's general general mm -hmm. feeling about it. Yeah, I, this, I think this, mm -hmm. this uh, diploma that's from this schools carries weight, and I think they know that. Mm -hmm. And so I find that they uh, tend to be more serious, uh, and. And I don't have um, anybody disappearing on me. That's you good. Know, that, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Like mm -hmm. I did maybe in the, in the first couple of years. Was, you mean they would just never come back to class, just disappear? Yeah. yeah, I know that. I have a couple, even so. But usually not. You know, and I think it depends on so many of the students now are very serious. And, of course, SMU has become a lot more diverse. Uh, there's uh, students from all over the world and uh, all, na all, all uh, ethnic groups. That, of course, when oh, you started, true, that was not true, the case, you know. When I was in New Orleans, <clears throat> in an associate pastor of this church, the seminary singers, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Oh, yeah. Gailey from Perkins, mm -hmm. came to sing at that church that morning. And my job was to, to bed them down, and we had two blacks in the seminary singers for the first time. Oh, really? And uh -huh. uh, I must admit get... that when they filed into the choir, which happened to be in the front of the church and up above the organ and so on, and here come these two black faces. There were a few little sounds really? in the congregation. 
Well, things have certainly changed. They certainly a lot have, since and for the, certainly yeah. for the better. In I mean, I was sense. talking to my students this morning about that SMU was was not integrated uh, at right. one time, and of course that they they did uh, the theology school uh, yeah. did uh, was the first to yeah, do the it. First ones. The first one, and then of course we've got more from other countries. Oh yes, oh, right. Really other good exactly, uh, for exactly. Sure. But it was a you know a very different world when you started mm -hmm. from what it is what it and is. And of course now. that puts. Uh, you know, a special kind of demand on the teacher to try to uh, reach uh, those people with those different backgrounds. Exactly, exactly. And uh, but it's very, you know, it's it's very rewarding to uh, to teach people from all these different backgrounds instead of the usual, um, uh, for, well, we say stereotype student that we've we've had for yeah. had for so long. I think that's no longer true. That as well, it, it's you just know, uh, and it, it and they've definitely made an effort to recruit to do that. Mm -hmm. They really have. And of course, mm -hmm. I think a big factor is they have made more money available. Uh, you know, the t tuition has gone up uh, uh, repeatedly compared to the yeah. state schools, but mm -hmm. they've really poured a lot of money uh, and uh, scholarships available, exactly. you know, things of that sort. So in a sense, you can go here if you are qualified to get in and really want to, and you can, you can make it. It's, Work study opportunity, other things like yeah, that. Yeah, they do. Know. They are really. I a think there's so many. And they're, I think, looking for more uh, opportunities for uh, you know more scholarships, more more money for the endowment to make this this possible because it is a you know it is expensive to come to SMU, but yeah. there are so many ways now. The president scholars yeah. and and uh, Deadman scholars, uh, uh, people that are not uh, able financially, will be able. Yeah. will be able to come here. Another change I think that's happened since I've been here is the ring of junior colleges around Dallas. That's right. That's a big Some switch, of whom wasn't it? Mm -hmm. excellent students wind up here, you mm -hmm. know, for another two years. Yeah. And it's been a good, um, a good, a uh, whole healthy academic influence in the whole area. Mm -hmm. uh, and it also is, um, I think, uh, they're, they're making it easier now for transfer students to come to SMU. They're actually trying to, they right. had lots of very Byzantine rules that yeah. they couldn't accept this, didn't accept that, and they're the trying to make, but anyway. <laughs> I don't know, they were trying to, uh, they're trying to make, or they have made that a yeah. lot easier, so that we'll be getting some really good transfer yeah. students yeah. and accepting credits that are actually okay to accept. Right. Yeah. For some right. reason, we had a lot of, because, you know, uh, and then we've turned out, now uh, philosophy department doesn't have a master's degree, but we've turned out some majors who did get master's degrees mm -hmm. elsewhere and are teaching in these oh, good. junior and the colleges, junior colleges. Uh -huh. uh, in philosophy and so on. So, and you know, th th you know, a person like that who went here satisfactorily in a discipline, who winds up teaching the discipline in a junior college, good. is a person who could put in a good word for the school here sure. and can direct encourage good students to come here mm -hmm. because that's that's what all the schools want is good, it's good students ones that are going to be a, be a, uh, get a good education themselves and be a credit uh, sure. to the school sure yeah. now did you you've taught both adults and and young people for a long time who do you, who do you prefer do you prefer, prefer the older people or younger or both <laughs> well different they're different mm -hmm. uh, i really like the uh, younger group I yeah. keep you know making allusions to my obvious fossil nature can compare oh, them come on. The, the, being 19 and 20 is so far away and I'm getting the students of my, the children of my first students okay. but that's the proof of the pudding <laughs> yeah. sure. but anyway it, there's a there's a stimulus of a young mind being stimulated by new ideas for the first time and and you feel that, and you get, get that feedback that, that's really exhilarating. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. See? Plus the challenge, uh, as again, I say, oh, of then. making the subject matter exactly. meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. Now, the older students in the MLA course, they are people who are, some of them are teachers, working, but others are there out of just sheer interest, mm -hmm. interest and self-enrichment. Mm -hmm. And they are, they are dependable, of course. They, right. Many of them have jobs. You know, cu cutting out three hours for class hard. after a full, full day at the work in the middle of the week, that kind of thing. But So they're well motivated and appreciative of your efforts. They're especially rewarding. And the informal courses 
I, I find stimulating because it, it's a mixed bag. They're in there out of interest. Right. And that's, 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 you're all, they're just already there. home yeah. when you're there, you know. Mm -hmm. And then of course, since that kind of a course is not, doesn't have the taxing demands of grading papers. And I must throw out uh, to you, Pam, that I got, you know, got infected with the English virus. Yeah, and right. Did too, I huh? did too. Certainly. So it's, it's, uh, there's no known cure. That's and true. So the result is, uh, ever since I started, I've correct spelling and grammar yes. and punctuation uh, free of charge. And you still uh, do that. And without, still good do for that. you. Good for you. And uh, uh, and so the papers are poured over carefully, and the students know that, mm -hmm. they and are. they're graded by the teacher, mm, that's not wonderful. by some assistant. Yeah, so that's like so it. important. And, and since I, I've never given a true and false test. I know Yet. you haven't. <laughs> I'm never going no, to. Never have. Well, good never for you. Have. I can remember those blue books. I never I have. Saying. Never have. So the result is a corrected blue book with essay questions and identifications in it mm -hmm. that reflects the material can be studied with profit for the final exam. And for me, a final exam is a final exam of the whole course. Exactly. Not remember. just a, another quiz. Cumulative. On the end. Cumulative. Right. See? Mm -hmm. So uh, that takes time. I just finished... 45 for the business ethics course week before last. Wow. And I have the proof of it. <laughs> I developed a fever blister as a result, oh, no. and I call it the Red Badge of Courage. And uh, I don't know if Stephen <laughs> Crane got the idea from that, <laughs> yeah. but I can tell you um, it's, it's now faded, and I'm Good glad because you. last so week on, I would have showed up and you would have had the red. So, anyway, uh, grading papers carefully gives me a chance to speak to the students. Yes, I love that. Mm -hmm. Correct that, mm -hmm. and it's, it, it's, it personalizes it, mm -hmm. and they have, a, they have a feeling. They know what's right and what's wrong, and they can profit right. by it. And it, it's part of the learning process. Mm -hmm. And it puts a burden on the teacher. It sure does. But I really think... <laughs> The poor Harrod English department can't do it all. All the teachers oh, ought to be correcting spelling and grammar. Well, yeah. good for you. Good for you. They really yeah. ought, to, ought to do that. Yeah. And uh, I do it, and I'm going to do it down to the end uh, uh, for sure. And uh, I, I think it's, 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 again, pointing out to students that you got away with bad spelling and poor punctuation and so on and grammar all the way along. Nobody really called your hand on that. It ought to be called now. And I'm calling it, and I Good hope you, you. Pay, pay attention to it. So. Good for you. You know, you are uh, really uh, just an inspiration. You're just uh, wonderful to be sitting here talking to you. I knew it would be wonderful and to hear about your career. And believe it or not, they were telling us we're out of time. Thank you so much. Okay, for, isn't that yeah. amazing? Enjoyed One it. hour. We really had <laughs> a great time. It did, didn't it? It was great. As my daughter said when she was.